Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, the webinar, as you um, kind of signed up for, is Leveraging Peer Review for Career Advancement. And this is put on by the Pathways to Promotion Committee, which is a um, committee within the ASA Statistical Consulting section. So um, we will kind of, I'll start us off and then we'll go into our discussion and with our panelists. So um, just a couple of resources. This, if you're new and haven't been to any of our webinars before, um, we have a number of kind of ASA consulting resources that are just part of our larger section. Um, the first um, kind of committee and group is the Pathways to Promotion, um, and we meet monthly. There's also Academic Statistics Consulting Center Hangout, with me, which meets a couple times a month. The Collaborative Healthcare Networking Group, which meets every other month. Month, and then a meetup for statistical consultants, which meets every month. Um, and feel free to reach out to their contact information if you're interested in joining. So um, a little bit more information about our specific committee. So we are a subcommittee of the section and our mission is to develop recommendations and tools to help the advancement of non-tenure track um, collaborative academic statisticians, um, along with kind of doing some help as well with tenure track um, collaborative statisticians as well. Um, and if you're interested in joining, please email Margaret. Um, she has been the kind of chair of the subcommittee for the past few years. And so if you are interested in seeing our other um, webinars, we have a number of webinars that have now been posted on our YouTube channel, um, going back to actually when we started this committee um, in 2021. Um, but these are the latest webinars from 2022 and 2023, um, kind of focusing on team science, burnout, negotiating, um, kind of your influence through power skills, and then also perspectives for staff statisticians. So um, we really want to foster community of statistical practitioners across diverse disciplines. And so that's why we're really called Pathways to Promotion. And it's been a great group of um, people from a variety of different backgrounds and different types of um, career paths. And so um, we that really is our goal is to provide an outlet um, for people within the statistical consulting section that are looking for ways for promotion. So just to give you a brief overview of what we'll be doing in our webinar um, today is um, I am introducing the webinar and then we'll get into our speakers presentations, which will go until 1245. This is Eastern time. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion with um, Q&A questions. And then we'll have some closing remarks and then um, a possibility to go into a breakout room if you would like um, to meet with some of the speakers as well. And we'll end about 130. So um, please do submit questions at any time during the presentation in the chat feature. We have people that are kind of combining those questions um, and we'll use those questions in the open Q&A session, um, kind of following each of the panelists. And we also have your questions that you submitted from the pre-survey as well. So thank you for doing that and we'll address those questions as well. Um, just to kind of introduce myself as I'll be kind of the MC um, for the panel is my name is Charlotte Bolch. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs at Midwestern University um, and I reside in the Arizona campus. There's also a campus in Illinois and um, I'm really excited about this webinar. I feel like peer review has been a way that I've really gotten to expand my statistical skills being a peer reviewer. Um, so I started as a peer reviewer during my PhD program and um, eventually kind of kept up doing reviews as I could um, throughout my career. And then uh, last year I was asked to be a associate editor for Journal of Statistics, um, Data Science, um, and Statistics Education. Um, and it's been a really great experience learning kind of the back end of how publication goes. And I really do think it's been uh, just provided me with a lot of um, ways to see how important it is to not only be part of the 
process of reviewing articles, but how important it is to make sure that we're getting good articles that are published and how important statisticians are to be a part of that. So I'm really looking forward to all of our panelists. So um, one thing that I do want to bring up before we get started is um, in this webinar, we really hope to address how peer review can be helpful for career advancement, how statisticians have gotten involved with peer review and how it has influenced their career. And um, one point that I would like to make is that um, we hope that out of this webinar, there's a way for us to all kind of crowdsource and gather information on people that are interested in being a um, reviewer for statistics journals. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to kind of find a large location where if you are being a reviewer and you can't do a review, you need, to, it's kind of nice to put, um, to tell the associate editor, hey, here's another person that I think would be interested. Or if you are an associate editor, trying to find some um, good scientific reviews um, for statistics um, can be, can be a little bit of a struggle sometimes. So um, if you are interested in, um, um, kind of signing up for a review to be a possibility for a reviewer, um, please fill out this Qualtrics form and it is going to be accessible to all reviewers on the consulting section microsite. Um, we are still in the process of figuring out how we're going to be displaying all that information, but it will be available um, in the future. So first off, um, I'd like to introduce Christina Mehta. She is the Associate Professor um, at Emory University, and she's the Director of Infectious Disease Biostatistics um, within the Department of Medicine. So thank you so much, Christina. And um, I will unshare my slides so you can share yours. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay, can everyone see slides now? Perfect. Uh, well, I'm really excited to be here and share a little bit of my thoughts around being a statistical reviewer and my experience. Um, so I'll just give you some of the background first. Uh, so I started reviewing scientific um, articles and domain science journals maybe several years into my faculty experience. Um, and I'm an ad hoc reviewer for like numerous domain science journals. At that point in my career, I didn't really have a, a domain niche that I focused my research on. Uh, so things that came along, I would uh, just agree to, to learn more about them. Uh, currently, I'm one of the statistical editors for the Journal of Infectious Diseases, uh, which is a highly ranked uh, journal in the area of infectious diseases. And I'm still an ad hoc reviewer, but for fewer domain science journals, just kind of in my area of HIV and women's health. Um, I'm also the current publications officer for the section on statistical consulting in the ASA. Um, okay, so I think we all can agree that reviewing is a lot of work, no matter how small the article is, there's a tremendous amount of effort that goes into it. But I'm here to convince you that there are benefits to being a statistical reviewer. Um, and so one of the primary ones is that it's good for your promotion. Um, being a statistical reviewer provides evidence of national reputation because the journal that you are likely reviewing for has national or international circulation. Um, and it's also a good way to demonstrate service to the profession, right? Service to your field of statistics and service to the domain science field that you might be working in. Um, so those are all very beneficial. And just on a professional level, it helps you learn new statistical methods that you might not have encountered previously or uh, maybe existing methods, but you didn't realize how to apply them into a particular area of domain science. Uh, you could learn new domain science areas. And then you could also learn uh, how to present your um, data analysis results, right? Tables, figures, there might be a way that someone's presenting it that's uh, really useful and applicable to the work that you do. And then another benefit to you as uh, for your profession is that it helps improve uh, communication in your own manuscripts, right? After you review a bunch of articles, maybe you realize where some of the flaws are and uh, challenges and so that motivates you to make improvements in your own work. Um, it also uh, increases your skills to critically review the scientific literature, you know, kind of draw away from the articles. What are the most important points? Uh, what is the ap approach and design, uh, you know, successes and flaws? 
And then another important area is the ability to summarize research that you have read and communicate succinctly, uh, you know, some of the highlights or areas of improvement. And lastly, it helps you build your networking skills. So you can build a network based on the relationships that you will develop with these journal editors. And it also gives you practice in utilizing your network to find other uh, reviewers. So like Charlotte mentioned, there may be times where you are not able to provide a review. You can reflect on your own network and maybe suggest another reviewer. Um, okay, so then we can talk about open peer review. This is becoming more common. Uh, but there is a lot of variation on what this exactly means. It really depends on the journal, but in all circumstances, you'll need to agree to it, right? When you agree to review, it'll um, describe what that uh, open peer review process is. And there's some pros and cons. There's actually lots out there on the internet if you want to look at it, but some pros would be, it helps foster a transparent scientific review process. Everyone can see what the original article was, uh, what the reviews were, and then how um, the study subsequently changed. And an important one is that you get credit for the actual review that you did. It's pretty time consuming to do a review. And so it's nice to have that uh, more transparent on the amount of effort that you put in. Um, a fairly large con though, is that there's concern about negative repercussions. Uh, perhaps when you do a review, you might be critical of someone who is more senior or powerful than you in the field. And um, there might be concern that those individuals could um, take action against you in uh, retaliation of that negative review. Uh, my own suggestion for providing reviews is to focus on helpful and constructive feedback. And so this is for all types of reviews, open peer review or the ones that are anonymous. Um, I suggest what I call the golden re rule for reviewers, right? Review others as you would want to be reviewed. Uh, don't set someone's trash can on fire with your very negative, harsh review. Um, we want to suggest actionable changes or edits that can really improve the manuscript um, or request for information and clarity that um, help uh, clarify for the audience uh, what's actually going on in the study. So an important aspect of uh, doing reviews is trying to get credit for it for your promotion purposes. And so a lot of journals now uh, have a way to do this publicly. And so I have a little screenshot here of uh, one of the journals that I review for. You know, do you wanna get recognition for this review on Web of Science? You can get it on ORCID. Um, so these are all opt-in, yes, no, I wanna get credit for it. Uh, my own philosophy is you might as well check that box, right? Another way to just demonstrate that you've done this review. Uh, a lot of journals also at the end of year have a, an annual list of all the reviewers that reviewed that year. And so I have a little screenshot of what it looks like for BMJ Open. And how exactly you document your effort for reviews probably depends on your promotion uh, criteria and what strategy you need. Um, but there, these are some options that are commonly available. Okay, so I think many of us have a choice in what manuscripts to review. Uh, and so I suggest manuscripts that we can provide sensible, helpful comments for. Uh, so, but what is that exactly? How can we narrow that down? Um, so this is of course debatable, but I suggest uh, articles that are in your domain expertise, right? So if it's an area that you commonly work in, you're knowledgeable, so you could review that confidently. You might even just be a regular domain science reviewer and not just the statistical part for um, articles that you have a lot of domain experience in. Um, you could also be a reviewer for things that you have some statistical methods expertise, uh, maybe higher tier journals, you want to accept those requests, uh, journals where you know people, right? You know the editors or you want to be considered for an editorship or where you or your collaborators submit a lot. So uh, this is the idea of reciprocity. And also it helps you uh, understand what the review process is for things that you submit. And then I also suggest uh, reviewing for journals that help promote your field. Right? Uh, so um, just to increase visibility of uh, your field. Okay, so here's the critical piece. How much time does it take to do a review? 
Well, when you um, get a request from a domain science journal, there's usually a really quick turnaround uh, to agree to review or decline. So we're talking days, like two or three days to decide if you can do the review. And then um, depending on the journal, you would then have maybe two to four weeks to actually conduct the review. And when that two to four week kind of timeline starts depends on the journal, right? So it might depend on when they emailed, it might depend on when you, when you accepted. Um, so it just, it varies. And I'll note that uh, even though it takes time to do these reviews, your efficiency does improve over time, right? You get better at it. It doesn't go to zero. It still takes time to do the reviews, uh, but it does get more efficient. So you need to budget the appropriate amount of time to review the manuscript, reflect on it, and then also write up your thoughts. So you'll really want to carefully consider your other pressing deadlines that you have in that two to four week period, right? Do I have grants that are due? Do I have abstracts, um, some other commitments that I need to work on? And uh, seriously consider those before you decide to agree. Uh, so reviewing revisions. So many times when you do a review, there'll be a question at the very end. It's like, you know, are you willing to review a revision? And so it's yes or no. Um, you could also be in a scenario where uh, an article was reviewed by domain scientists and those domain scientists flagged it for additional statistical review. So when it comes back as a resubmission, it will come to a, um, a statistical reviewer. And my own experience suggests that re-reviews take you know, similar to maybe more time as the original review because you have more things to go through. Uh, you have to review the previous reviewer comments and then the author's responses to those comments and then the revised manuscript and you have to do this in the same timeline that you had for an original submission, right? So <laughs> a little bit more work, uh, but the same amount of time. Okay, so every time I review an article, I think it's gonna be super straightforward and not take very long. And it's actually always uh, much more time consuming than I think. Uh, so how many manuscripts should you review when we're thinking about this as uh, for your career? I kind of, I polled uh, some members of the Pathways to Permission Committee to get their thoughts on this. And so there's a lot of different rules of thumb. So maybe one article per semester, one every two months, one for every article you submit. That's the rule that I've heard at my institution. But I'll note if you're a collaborative statistician, this actually could be quite a bit <laughs> of reviewing. Uh, so that's something to carefully consider. Uh, and really, you should just look at your promotion criteria to see what you need for this. And I'll note again that reviewing is more helpful early in your career uh, because it helps you get a new perspective, additional exposure to statistical methods, uh, and to additional exposure to domain science, but it is more time consuming. So um, the review process should not be overly burdensome. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, so to that end, you might need to decline a request to review an article. Uh, so we want to avoid the avocado uh, graph of work-life balance where work is like this enormous chunk of the graph. Uh, so it's okay to say no. And in a lot of the journals, uh, if you review there quite a bit, you can state the dates when you're unavailable, say going on a vacation or attending a conference and um, don't want to review during that time. And then yes. I, just, um, I just wrote here a few ways to politely decline and, you know, maybe keep the door open so that the editors will think of you again, right? So thank you for considering me, but due to prior commitments, I'm unable to review, please keep me in mind, or thank you for considering me, but I don't have the expertise. Um, some potential reviewers are X, Y, and Z. Um, and I'll note here that the Pathways Promotion Committee has a sign-up sheet that you can sign up so that uh, you can join the list of potential reviewers. I think that's all I had. Great, thank you so much, Christina. Yeah.
So next we have Emily Leary. She is an assistant professor um, and is also the director of um, orthopedic biostatistics in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at University of Missouri. So look, uh, go right ahead, Emily. Let me stop sharing my slides. Thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> and thanks to the Pathways to Promotion Committee for um, letting me talk uh, about my, my role as a statistical editor. So I'm currently the statistical editor for the Journal of the International Society of Arthroscopy, Knee Surgery, and Orthopedic Sports Medicine. Um, I have other positions, um, but that is what I will talk about. And so that is uh, one of my big disclosures. Um, I'm also the owner of an independent consulting firm. Um, so I thought I would start by talking about how I came to be in this role and um, my journey and what has made me successful. Um, so in 2018, I had a leading role on an R34 grant, and um, that is a funding mechanism for those unfamiliar uh, to support a large clinical trial. So in the academic world, I was still considered junior faculty at that time. And so I was paired with a more senior faculty at another institution who had significant experience planning clinical trials. Um, and that had kind of a similar background and training to my, my own training. So um, unbeknownst to me at the same time, he was advocating or really being a sponsor for me using mentoring language uh, to eventually take over his role as statistical editor for this journal. Um, so in the next year, I was invited to perform multiple reviews as a methodologist reviewer. And also unbeknownst to me at the time, these, these reviews were being reviewed by um, more senior reviewers and my reviews were being scored by current members of the editorial board. Um, so after I passed their review for completeness, comprehensiveness, rigor, and content knowledge, it was only then that I was invited to join their journal as a statistical editor. And um, another big piece of that was um, also unbeknownst to me is that my sponsor had been lobbying the journal um, to allow for a small stipend to be a part of this role. And so I also benefited from that in, the, in that way. Um, so my initial contract as statistical editor was paid and it was for a 14 month period. And I will say not all journals are like that. And so kind of knowing um, who has what can also help you, um, you know, leverage that if you are offered that type of role. Um, so when that contract expired, I uh, went back to the negotiating table and I was asked to double the amount of reviews that I would uh, agree to do in a year. Um, and I am really glad that uh, Dr. Mehta talked about re-reviews because I specifically asked if re-reviews were a part of that count. <laughs> And they were not. <laughs> and so it's really good to know going into it kind of, you know, that could double essentially your scope of work um, and knowing what that means for your other time commitments. Um, so anyway, we agreed on an amount and then this contract was uh, for an additional 18 month period paid. Um, so my success as um, a, statistical, a statistical editor or things that helped me earn and keep this role were um, the rigor of reviews that I provided, um, the timeliness of reviews. So these are things that kind of make it easy for people to say yes to you to continue in your role. Um, this is a personal uh, characteristic of me is that I have to look the whole paper to actually review the methods. I I guess I'm just not that good or um, I don't have the attention span to just look at the methods. And so I actually have to review the whole manuscript, even if I'm just asked to look at the methods. Um, so um, this is not explicitly part of my role and responsibilities, but it certainly um, helped to make me a valuable statistical editor. And I've actually been a content reviewer as well for specific type, types of manuscripts. So just beyond the methodology. Um, 
So we had a, uh, when I first joined, we had one editor in chief. And then since I've been in this role, um, uh, that person retired. And so a new editor in chief assumed the role last year. And so with this transition, there could be changes to the editorial board, including the statistical editor position. Um, and so I met when this transition was occurring, I met with the new editor in chief and the handling editor. And it's funny because there was no agenda for this meeting, but um, you know, they asked me, well, what do you think? What are some suggestions that we could use to improve um, you know, the citations and uh, the journal itself? And I had a list already in my head. And so some of the things I mentioned were methodological, methodological, and I have them here. Um, but some are how people use papers. So I use papers to power studies and other things. And I'm not sure that they had really thought about, um, you know, citations in that way. Um, and so I also talked about how we could imp improve communication and dissemination for the journal through the use of um, uh, ORCIDs or, you know, other uh, social media handles. Um, I also have very specific thoughts on post hoc power analyses that um, I will not share here. <laughs> uh, so in meeting with the new editor in chief, um, they actually shared with me that they have uh, a kind of an internal proprietary method for assessing the quality of reviews that they get, um, which the handling editor and others are responsible to assess. And so I had not known that this was uh, previously um, occurring. And so I asked them more information about it because I thought it would be helpful to know how I'm being assessed as a reviewer, um, but also like how I could improve. Um, and so they, uh, and I got permission to share this. The way that they do this is that uh, reviews of the reviewers are done using a score from zero to a hundred and higher scores indicate a more rigorous review. And so I have different categories listed here on the slide. And for each category, there are point scores assigned. And so some categories have more points um, possible than others. Um, so this is a, a proprietary and it's internal, but I can tell you things that have the asterisk are, have more points are available and they're scored, um, you know, they're weighted more in assessing the quality of the review again, this is the quality of the review and not the quality of the manuscript itself. So these are two separate metrics and I don't want to get them confused. Um, and so that's how we are working to um, improve the rigor of, of our journal. Um, we are also doing a sort of a, a, a new initiative because lately it has been problematic and I think other handling editors and people on editorial boards ha have this issue as well. Um, it's been hard to find high quality reviewers that are willing to review in a timely, uh, you know, rigorous way. Um, and I heard a very interesting statistic from another faculty member. Um, and this is, you know, uh, journals that are more in a methodology arena, but um, they said that a handling editor could send out eight review requests in the past to get at least two people to say yes. Now they are sending about 38 requests to get the same two uh, acceptances to review a manuscript. So I think this is a really important point, particularly for our, um, um, for us as methodologists, to ensure that we are, um, you know, being advocates and providing reviews as a service to our profession. Um, so to combat this issue, our journal has started a new initiative and um, this helps in multiple ways. So I think for the reviewers, it helps to provide them with kind of an honor and award that is helpful for their promotion and recognition of service to their field. Um, for our journal, these are called elite reviewers, and these are designated special expert reviewers. Um, we have them for each focus area that our journal covers, 
And we have an international readership. And so we have also geographical dis diversity for these um, elite reviewers. Um, if you are selected to be offered a role as an elite reviewer, um, some of the requirements are that you are required to review at least 20 articles a year, that you have to do these reviews um, in a timely way, you have to be uh, punctual, and you have to be willing to provide uh, what's called a more rapid review. And so what this means is that my journal is using elite reviewers as sort of a um, mechanism or stopgap if other reviewers kind of fall off the radar or don't get their reviews done on time, elite reviewers are called in to, um, you know, make sure that authors don't have their manuscripts sitting for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks at a journal. Um, you know, this also helps to address the reviewer shortage, which is uh, becoming a, a big problem. Um, and here I just want to advocate that peer review is so, so important to the field, but it's also important to methodologists that we're open to doing our share of peer review, even in the applied fields that we may work in. Um, and so, you know, that ensures that, you know, we're known in the field, but also that only the highest quality work is published. Um, okay, so in summary, things that have been um, basically essential for me to find these roles and to excel in these roles is, you know, initially sponsors. So I would not have been able to find these opportunities on my own. It's just my relationships and the sponsors that I've had that have um, provided these opportunities to me. Um, I would say don't miss out. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was really ready for this, but, um, you know, now I think if you're about 50% ready, then you're able to take on a role and grow in that role. And if you're maybe more than, you know, 75%, then maybe you should be doing something else that's more advanced so that you can grow. Um, so for me, uh, having a high quality holistic review philosophy has been important for my success. Um, but again, others have other um, ways of doing things that have been successful for them. Um, the other thing is that being consistent and being on time has been so important to the journals that I review for, as well as the editors. Um, basically, if you can make their job easy, it is much easier they want to work with you. And I think that's important to remember. Um, and that is all I have. So I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Okay. Okay, our last um, person that will be um, our speaker for this webinar before we get into our panel discussion is Robin Ball. She is a computational scientist at the Jackson Laboratory and also an independent consultant. And she is also the chair of the ASA statistical consulting section. So we're really excited to have her speak as well. So take it away, Robin. Thank you very much, Charlotte. All right, uh, really grateful to for this opportunity to talk to you today. I think I have somewhat of a different perspective on the, through that in a minute, um, but I'm gonna talk a lot about how I ended up being an editor on a special issue and how that's helped my career in different ways. So first of all, I am in a nonprofit research institute. So it's structured similarly to academia, but not exactly. So I'm non-faculty, I'm in the data science group. And for promotion, the things that they look at are manuscripts, certainly. Peer review is not really asked for or documented for this. I do it anyway, I think we should all do it anyway. Um, but the things that are focused on are manuscripts, of course, high quality manuscripts, high quality journals, impactful contributions, and service to other institutions or associations counts, but it doesn't like, count as much as the other things I'd say. So what I'm gonna talk about, I do service anyway. Um, service really can help career in advancement in other ways, even if it doesn't count for your promotion or isn't as big a deal for your promotion. And the truth is it's really all about access. That's what I've discovered through doing it. 
Um, you get access to well-known leaders in statistics, to leadership, to, uh, and this often leads to other opportunities for career advancement. So the motivation for this is that we really need a journal devoted to statistical practice. This is how I got into it. And so I just want to briefly go over this. I know there's a lot of words on the slide, but I'll summarize. <laughs> so as we know, practicing statisticians really need a venue to both uh, show the work that they've done and learn from others. But unfortunately, statistical pr practice articles are either regarded as not technical enough for you know, mainstream statistical journals, or they're regarded as too technical for domain-specific journals. And much of our work is put in the supplemental, as probably most of you are aware. So in the end, it's really a challenging thing to do. So. Uh, that's what came from our section, and so um, that's what we've been working on for the past oh, almost five years now. But my pathway into this started with ASA Service. Um, I was asked to join the executive committee, and I thought, well, which one should I go for? And I thought, well, I'll do an at-large member. That's really nice, low-profile position, um, just a little bit to get my feet wet, see how it feels. But actually, it, it turned out being quite a bit more than that. Um, so all of this came through okay. section membership saying we really need, we really need a journal devoted to our work. And so the chair asked me to co-chair a, a journal committee to see if we could get a journal of statistical practice off the ground. So this in turn led to uh, meetings with a lot of different people. We presented to the ASA committee on publications. We could present it to the ASA board of directors. And through it all, we did have uh, guidance both from people in the section, from executive committee members, and ASA leaders writ large. But it was it was hard to continue to do this um, because we were denied. We, they denied our proposal at every single step, even though they recognized that there was a gap that needed to be filled. And and so when we after we had presented to the ASA board of directors, um, Ron Wasserstein the um, he 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 contacted us and said, why don't you try to organize a special issue? Because that would really help gauge, you know, the the breadth and depth of the articles that we were likely to get. And so we, then we started on that road. We first started with ASA journals, but they said, no, we, we're not interested in that. But fortunately, uh, Maggie New, who was chair in 2022, she had a colleague that was the editor of Stat Journal, uh, Helen Zhang. And so we sent her our proposal and she was very supportive. Um, we spent a lot of time going back and forth on the criteria because as I just stated, these articles are not exactly the type of articles that you see in other journals. So since it's a new thing, it was kind of hard to say, well, this this is a good article, this is not a good article. Um, and we went back and with, with, with the editor to make sure that we would get high quality high quality articles that were eventually published. So we started the special issue on statistical consulting and collaboration. Uh, I served as editor on the special issue. And then we had other committee members who served as associate editors. And we ended up publishing 24 articles on statistical practice. I will say this was quite a bit of work at the time, but definitely worth it. Um, we had a highly successful special issue, which eventually led to other opportunities. So uh, the QR code that you see here will take you to the journal. We, since we published 24 articles, and you see this in the bar graph here, um, most of the other special issues in this journal, you know, only published 10, 11, five, and most was 18. Um, so that was really good news for us. And you can see the breakdown of those manuscripts as well, because we had to organize them. We organized them into different sections. Um, so what did this lead to? Well, certainly I think it's part of the reason that I was asked to run for chair for the ASA section, and now I am chair. I, and because I'm chair, I can push these initiatives forward a bit more along with other consulting initiatives. Um, when it comes time, hopefully, for being nominated to uh, as an ASA fellow, I will note that they these things count as positive scores. So you can see their scoring criteria if you go look for it, but um, you get, you know, two pluses for being a chair, one plus for being an associate editor, and there's a lot of other things. Um, so that, that does help me certainly if I wanna be an ASA fellow. 
Um, I was also act, asked to be a panelist on the closing panel at uh, this year's conference on statistical practice. And it was really cool because I got to sit on that stage with the ASA executive director and the incoming president of ASA, ASA president-elect. So that gave me even more exposure to leadership, which then led to an invitation to revise our proposal and, and um, present it to the ASA executive committee. So that's what we're working on now, as well as discussions with a lot of other people. So I get exposure not only to leadership, but to leaders in the field and just generally statisticians, which is great. So what I'll say about opportunities, right? How do, I, how do you get more opportunities like this? There are various ways of going about it. I think definitely first, like walk through open doors. If someone asks you to do something and you have the time to do it, right? Go ahead and go ahead and walk through that open door. If nobody asks you, volunteer. We're always looking for people to help with different things. And that kind of gets you in the door and then people will generally ask you to do other things. So I think service to the ASA or other professional side, society is not only important, right? But it gives us these opportunities to advance our career. And last but not least, persevere. You know, it's like you think about this journal initiative, right? We started in 2019. So it was really important to just keep going, right? Keep going. But the other piece of this is ask for help. Right. Um, if I don't, I don't have to be the one always carrying the ball forward. You know, I can give it to other team members to do that, and then they can give it back to me. But if we work as a team, it really works better. So, in in summary, I'll say, even though peer review and service may not be tied to promotion at your institution, do it anyway, and do it anyway because it helps you uh, become a better statistician, I believe. But also, it can open doors. Um, that can lead to other opportunities and really advance your career that way. I would say ask for help, as I just said, ask for help. Um, when one person gets tired or too busy, you know, because of other commitments, another person can come in and push it forward. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is walk through open doors, even if it's scary. You know, I definitely have imposter syndrome. I think a lot of people do, you know, but, and I'm like, I don't think I can do this, right? But but you just walk through it anyway. And the truth is, my experience has been there's always people to help and guide you along the way if you ask. And um, so anyway, walk through open doors and then volunteer. Contact others. You can contact me if you want to serve. Ask if you can help. There are lots of different initiatives to get involved in. So that's all I've got for today. Really great to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. Okay. So the next part um, of our webinar is going to be a, a discussion with all of our panelists. Um, so if you do have any questions, um, please put them into the chat feature. And so to kind of get us started off, um, what are your experiences with peer reviews, but also kind of addressing a question and from our pre-survey is what are some common challenges that you've encountered and how have you been able to overcome those challenges? Anybody want to go first? I can't. I'll, go I'll choose you. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you are you can you repeat the first part of the yes. question? Yes. Yeah. So um, we just kind of wanted to get the discussion started talking about, you know, in general, what is your experience with the peer review process and what are specific challenges that you've had and how can you overcome those challenges um, kind of through um, constructive feedback? Sure. So I think for me, the initial challenge was sort of getting my foot in the door. Um, particularly when I decided to focus on orthopedics, um, because that was definitely a, a domain shift for me and expertise and what I would be doing. Um, and so the, the way I did that was just by accepting reviews that, um, you know, were within the realm of expertise, um, and, 
you know, learning more by doing, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, and so, you know, being willing and able to provide reviews um, has been helpful to kind of get the ball rolling, if you will. And I also want to say too, I think if you have any, anybody attending the webinar has their experiences with peer review, please put that into the chat. Um, so that was also my intention too, to start getting stuff into the chat as well. So Christina or Robin, do you have anything to comment on kind of some challenges? I know you kind of talked about some of them in your talk, but anything specific you want to mention? Yeah, I just, I agree with Emily. I think, um, it's hard to get started being a reviewer, actually, because no one knows who you are. <laughs> um, so I think that's where the referral piece from colleagues who are unable to do a review is really important. Um, and then like once your name gets out there, it's, I think, much easier to, to do these reviews. Um, I guess some challenges, I think I mentioned this in my talk, is just the timeline. And so whenever I get a request for a review, I just try to be very mindful of all the other competing things that are on my plate before I agree to something. So just kind of being aware of what the requirement is and my ability to do a high quality review. Robin, do you have anything to add? If not, I can go on to another question. I think the only thing I'll add is that um, ask somebody for how you should review an article. I think, you know, when I first started, it wasn't quite sure like what I needed to do or how to do it, what things I needed to cover. And so having uh, someone who's done it for a while show you those things is really helpful. Yeah, that is something we've been talking about as we're kind of preparing this webinar too, is that there's a variety of ways um, I think you can potentially piggyback on somebody. So that is something where you would have to ask the associate editor when you get assigned a review, if it's okay, if you either, you're a mentor and you wanna involve um, one of your students or somebody that's a little bit more junior colleague in a review. Um, I know that my PhD advisor asked me to help a review. Um, and, you know, it's it's a kind of a learning process. And I also think it's it's also, you know, if you've submitted articles going back through and then maybe changing how certain people uh, review, um, you can kind of change how you review based on what you feel like is more productive um, as you're kind of submitting those reviews too. I know I always like when people are very specific um, with specific comments. Um, so it's kind of a great way to kind of think through the process. It's just, yeah, we're trying, to, hopefully that list, we're trying to get people, if they are interested, um, to get that kind of spread out there. So, um, so next, um, let's see. Uh, let's, so we have a couple of different questions. I'm going to go with one from the chat. So what do you think of the um, potential reviewer asking, will my reviews be evaluated? Um, and if so, may I receive some feedback from that evaluation so I can approve? Have you had any experience with that getting, so having reviews submitted and then giving specific feedback back to that review on how they can improve their reviews? Um, so for me, no. So I, interestingly enough, I was not part of the committee that put together these sort of evaluation criteria, even though I think that um, they did a good job in putting it together. Um, I have not been a part of that. Um, the interesting thing is I didn't know this was happening. And so when I learned that it was happening, um, I was not given any of the like graded scores for any of my prior reviews. Um, but the overall sort of assessment I got was like, well, you know, you're doing fine. We want you to come back. So, um, you know, it was very positive. But no, I am not given sort of like a review, anything that I can hold my hands on and reflect back on. Um, but I think, you know, I hadn't known this, this was a thing. And I think it's, you know, I, I kind of share Dr. Mehta's um, sort of the golden rule, <laughs> you know, I only give reviews that I would want to receive that are actually meant to, you know, encourage and help the authors uh, provide the best possible work. 
Um, and so I think, you know, kind of having in that, that in mind, um, you're going to have a much better uh, reputation as a reviewer score or whatever than you would um, without. Great, thank you. Christina, Robin, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I also have not received direct feedback from any of the journals that I reviewed with the exception of saying like, uh, at the end of the year, thank you for sending your reviews in on time. And, <laughs> and then anecdotally talking to editors that I know and having them, you know, comment on um, the helpfulness of the review and the comprehensiveness, but no uh, metric like was shown earlier, which I think is great. <laughs> Maybe we can all self-evaluate using that. Right. I just said, like, I think I would like to give feedback sometimes to the people that review my papers, <laughs> but it also is really good, you know, to help me know, like, what's a good review, what is really helpful versus what feel doesn't feel great at all. Um, so I think that helps me when I was the editor of the special issue, I got reviews all over the place and I never gave them feedback, but they didn't ask either. So I think if you ask, they'd probably give you feedback. Yeah. I don't think it's out of the ordinary, especially if you're, you know, you could ask feedback, I think, from an associate editor if you submit a review. Um, definitely. Okay. Um, let's see. So going back to one of the pre-survey ones, um, questions, how can you quantify um, slash leverage peer mentorship or mentorship of students um, as a master's level statistician? And when is it not necessarily part of the job description? So again, how can you quantify and leverage peer mentorship or mentorship of students as a master's level statistician, um, maybe working with some more junior um, statisticians, um, especially when it's not necessarily part of your job description? Yeah, I think this is a good one. I mean, I think if depending on your your job, I think, you know, mentorship and, and you would sort of be in a mentorship teaching role in um, it seems like that environment. And so um, I think that would certainly fall within the realm of that role is to kind of teach students how to do a peer review that would be, you know, rigorous, appropriate, whatever. Um, and that's, you know, an activity that you could potentially do together. Um, I know, I think um, I maybe not in this presentation, but I had um, a colleague who was an associate editor who sent me a review. Um, to do a methodology review in a, you know, in a journal outside my, my domain expertise. But, um, you know, I asked if I could bring on a, a, a student who was in a PhD program about this to kind of teach him how to, to do a review. And we talked about things and, you know, what's an appropriate review, what's inappropriate and how to word that. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely a mentorship opportunity for the student, um, and that certainly should be, you know, I would assume given the way the question was asked part of that role. Yeah, and I think um, the other thing that helped me when I was, I was working in a large group of statisticians, I think we had like 30 people in our group. And so we were all writing papers all the time. And one of the things that, that I found really helpful was a couple of people would like, you know, somebody was trying to publish their paper, a couple of people in the group would give you a really good review and make some notes, share it with others. And then we would all talk about it together. And I found that process so helpful that I can now do that with others. So anytime you have a chance to do something like that, I think that's a good opportunity. Yeah, definitely. I'll note that I've seen a few journals recently have a place on the review to to state whether or not you had a reviewer in training work with you on your review, oh, nice. uh, which I think is great. It, I think it encourages us to have mentees for reviews, and then they also get credit for it as um, part of the review process. So that's a neat thing that I think is um, becoming more common. Nice. Yeah, and I would also just, I want to chime in about confidentiality. So uh, I think getting express permission to bring on a trainee, it sounds like there are mechanisms with some journals 
um, but maybe not others to do that. Um, I think it's important to get permission to kind of have another set of eyes on it, but also for credit for that person. Okay, um, another question from the chat. So going into consulting, how would you suggest is more important to prioritize peer reviews, projects, publications, blogs, et cetera? How do you kind of fit in peer review? Um, and I, I'm assuming this person is asking about going to consulting like um, in like an independent consultant. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on what you're doing and what your goals are, right? So we recently had a webinar, it's going to be up on YouTube soon, about getting started as a consultant. And Steve Simon talked about this specifically about, you know, he does peer review articles, but um, he's not required to. It doesn't really help his career in other ways, other than being really up to date on statistics and you know seeing what other people are doing, which I think always helps. So I think it really depends on what you're doing and what your goals are. No, definitely. I think it's such an important thing. I um, as you're going as an independent consultant, it's really to prioritize. I think the structure of a of a job sometimes gives you that priority, but you're having to kind of evaluate yourself. And so I would highly recommend that if you are going through that process, look at the webinar that um, Robin is mentioning that's going to be up and also uh, join the statistical consulting section and get involved with that independent consultant group too. I think they're a really great resource and um, we also greatly encourage any comments or questions on the ASA consulting section forum. So if you have any questions and you want to reach out there to try to find some other people on how to kind of navigate that, um, I would highly recommend that as well. We're a very nice group of people, I think, that always enjoy kind of communicating on that forum. So um, let's see. Charlotte, before you move yeah. on, I just I want to say just quickly to emphasize something that Robin said is that I, I think it's something that you, you know, even sometimes I, I do this a lot and I don't recognize the impact it has, but doing reviews actually provides a lot of up-to-date, you know, content knowledge on methods or new things coming out or new procedures or whatever in a way that makes it, um, you know, forces you to stay current if you are, you know, maybe less structured like me and, you know, you have time set aside, but it never seems to work out that way. Having kind of um, sort of a mechanism so that you uh, kind of help yourself keep current peer review is a great opportunity for that. So I just wanted to emphasize that. A really great point too. Being able to find time, I think, to research journals about new methods is, I think, you know, that sometimes gets put down to the lowest priority in the to-do list with everything going on. So, no, that's a great point. Thanks, Emily. Um, so seeing in the chat, um, people are kind of talking about a lot of different ways um, you know, thinking about how your review is being judged. Um, so do you have any, does anybody have um, any kind of question or I guess uh, perspectives or references besides what Emily had given as a checklist um, to kind of find a checklist or a guide to help make sure you're kind of doing a complete review? I think this is really great. I mean, I think it's, it's great to start thinking about that um, as you're doing the review. So any comments on kind of how to maybe structure a review or make sure you're hitting all the points appropriately? The only thing I'd say is pay attention to what the associate editor is asking you to do or what the journal is asking you to do. They have reasons for that. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the best thing. And then yeah, watching Emily's stuff again, I think would also be good. Um, I will say, you know, something that surprised me with the metric is that they actually gave points if the reviewer would summarize the research in their own words um, as, I think, a gauge for how well they understood kind of the goal and the point of the project. And so I think that's a good check, you know, if... Yeah. 
you kind of mess that up, maybe, you know, there might be some issues with the rest of the review. Um, and so I think that's something that maybe we don't think about um, focusing on the methods, but I think that um, kind of provides a, a good uh, um, way to, to sort of gauge it. Oh, definitely. I think as associate editor, I always appreciate when people provide that. I've added that on to all of the reviews that I do is kind of like a overview at the start. And then I work through each of the sections. So uh, the way I structure mine is I go through, I have comments on the introduction, methods, results, and conclusions. And then, then I put at the end any kind of like the minor grammar errors. And if I see a lot of grammar errors, I like make note to that, to the to the editor or the associate editor if I'm submitting the review. I think, you know, if there is a lot of those grammar errors, I don't think it's always the requirement for the reviewer to catch all of those. It might then lead, sometimes the journals will have like a, a way, a resource to kind of provide somebody if they need a little bit more of a grammar editor, you know, asking the kind of in the review response to ask somebody to kind of have somebody uh, review for grammar within your own institution, I think sometimes. Yeah. Too. So, I mean, I think that there is a little bit of contra. I wanted to talk about that because we have an international readership. And so, you know, I kind of paid attention to, um, you know, I think people who, um, you know, maybe don't adhere to the American style of English or, you know, or even who are non-native speakers, I think, um, you know, being, I tend to be a little more explicit in terms of, you know, how, how I identify grammar errors. If I, if I get a sense that that's an issue, because I don't think it helps our colleagues who are non-native speakers to say, Hey, have someone who's a native speaker review this, like that's not constructive. Um, and so, it, it, and actually this is sort of a recent change. Um, I've been a little more sensitive to providing actual explicit ways in which they can, um, you know, increase the readability or the clarity of their, of their um, manuscript. The other thing I wanted to point out that Terry put in the chat is, um, you know, if you are, uh, you know, maybe a, a Jack or Jill of all trades, there are specific reporting guidelines for different types of studies. So she put in the chat a link to the Equator Network for reporting guidelines. There's also uh, Cosmin for patient reported outcomes. And so, you know, if you are looking at outcomes that maybe you're not as familiar with, you might want to do a quick Google search on um, best reporting practices for those. Great. Thank you. Wonderful point, Emily. So there are a couple other questions that I wanted to bring up. One I kind of have seen as the chat has been going as well um, is talking about, you know, service as a reviewer and how it's documented. I know there was a couple of places that I believe Christina was talking about. Um, so it, there's a, it's, you know, once again, there's a whole field of different ways that people have been trying to document this. And of course, it's not just one area, I think, where um, people go to. But Christina, do you want to mention again, where those were and kind of what your thoughts are doing this? Um, the person was saying, I've seen this done through an ORC ID too. So do you have any other comments on that? Yeah, so um, I think it varies by journal. So Web of Science also has a like Publons where you can get credit for your reviews and then ORCID, you could get credit for your reviews that way. Um, so for me, if the journal allows that as like an opt-in, I'm like, sure, give me credit for it. But if it doesn't, I don't go out of my way to add it, <laughs> but maybe I should. Um, and then also a lot of journals at the end of the year will have a list of reviewers. Um, so your name could appear there if you need some more firm documentation. And then usually you'll get a thank you email after you complete your review. So that's further documentation if you need it for whatever your situation might be as um, I don't know if the other panelists or um, audience members have thoughts. I think another question to kind of go off that is somebody's asking about service as reviewers and editors is viewed by your supervisors and institutions. 
um, kind of going out, I mean, a way to show your supervisor as you're going through your review process, I think is the fact that you can go to Web Science or Orc ID and show them, hey, I've reviewed this many things, even if um, it's not necessarily part of your specific requirements. It's always a nice thing, I think, to add, showing that you're contributing to the field and being a collaborator. But I wouldn't rely on your supervisor institution to seek that out as part of your review. I think you have to be pretty explicit about providing that information to them. Um, yes. So, yeah. Okay, um, another question that I was seeing that I think was brought up in the pre-survey um, as we're kind of coming down to the last few minutes of this discussion. Um, so somebody asked, occasionally a me medical collaborator has asked me to give an opinion on a paper they were asked to review. Is this a reasonable request and should I agree to do this? So this is something I'm asked to do sometimes. And I think it depends on, um, you know, I have a very strong working relationship with um, physicians and surgeons. Um, it kind of depends on the working relationship there. I think it's a reasonable um, request to ensure that they have permission to share um, that confidential inter information with you. And I think if you explicitly ask that, then I would also ask if there's an avenue for you to get credit. Um, because I think one thing that we need to do is to be recognized as methodologists. And, uh, you know, I am not in the habit of checking others, you know, statistics or methods work. And I don't think, um, you know, that I definitely wouldn't advocate for that. So, you know, do you have permission to share this and, and will I get um, appropriate recognition for the work that I'm doing as part of this global review, I think are appropriate questions to ask. Um, you know, and then I think if, if those things check the boxes that you need them to check, then it's kind of up to you if you have the, the bandwidth and the time to consider such a request because, um, you know, to me, that would be a, a, a lower priority review than what I'm, you know, individually and explicitly been asked to do. Yeah, I've only been asked a couple of times to do that. And my criteria has generally been like, is this, is this going to take a lot of my time or is this something I can do re relatively quickly? Do they just need some overall guidance on the statistical methods? Um, and is this relevant to my work? I think that's the other piece. And it always has been with the people that have asked me to do it. It was actually a very interesting article to read, so I didn't mind. Um, but I don't think it should be a burden at all, you know, because it's not our, it's not our review. No, exactly. I've been asked to do the same type of thing too. I think sometimes I work with a lot of people publishing in journals that do not have any statistical type of oversight too. And so I sometimes just get asked, hey, can, is this method even appropriate for this? And, you know, sometimes if I have time and energy, I'll be able to kind of look at it. But I will say it is kind of like a, you know, it's, you do need to ask for permission that you're able to kind of see that review too. So I think that's, you know, it's it's another reason too, I think, for advocating for the field that there needs to be, you know, statistician reviewers on journals and or people with um, the expertise to be able to do that. But as we all kind of know, there's a wide variety of people that believe they have statistical expertise too. So um, that is kind of, uh, yeah, something I think that is a constant process that I believe like the ASA and people, especially in this consulting group, are really just trying to improve um, statistical literacy and kind of the overall perspective on how statisticians are, are viewed, especially in a collaborative environment. So um, let's see. So we are kind of coming to the end of our discussion time. I know there's still some more questions in the chat. Um, if you would like to kind of ask those, if we go into breakout um, groups in a second, but I just wanted to make sure we had the last five minutes before we go into those breakout rooms for people to give any kind of closing remarks. So um, I will kind of go backwards. So Robin, would you have anything to kind of add and sum up um, your thoughts? 
Well, I just want to th say thank you for asking me to do this. I really wasn't sure since I don't do a ton of peer review, um, but I'm glad I got to talk about my journey through it because I think it really opens the door for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Emily? Um, I, I would just say that I think about this as being a steward of the profession. And so, you know, a lot of the people that I work with are not methodologists. They're in medicine or they are in medical sciences. And so I think um, I see myself as being a steward of our profession. And that's how I try to conduct myself um, with my reviews, but also, uh, you know, being a contributor to, you know, the broader editorial board and having these kinds of discussions about, you know, um, native versus non-native speakers, readership, um, you know, how to address, um, you know, this non-native speaker um, trainees. Um, so these are all things that I think that, you know, we can do to advocate. Um, and the other thing is I am not great about <laughs> setting aside time to review new papers. So this, you know, is a service, but it essentially forces me to do that. And so it's a nice, um, you know, checking multiple boxes. And so I wouldn't, um, you know, just discount it based on the time commitment, because I think we get a lot, I get a lot from the reviews that I conduct. Um, and so I would just say, don't, don't forget about that part of it. Christina? Um, I just want to thank everyone and uh, for having me on this panel. And I really value all the contributions from the other panelists and from the audience. I've been looking at the chat and um, I think reviewing is hard and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I mean, ultimately, I think it should be a net positive for everyone. Um, so really great to see all the comments and have the discussion here. That's all. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, I just wanted to take the last few minutes before we go into breakout rooms just to um, kind of wrap up and provide you with the last bit of resources. Um, thank you so much to all of you on uh, coming to the webinar and also thank you to Robin, Emily and Christina for being our panelists. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to keep putting on these webinars if people weren't attending and being interested in them. So thank you all for attending. I just want to acknowledge um, our members of the subcommittee of Pathways to Promotion, um, and especially like to give a shout out to Margaret Stedman, um, our chair. She does has done a wonderful job leading our Pathways to Promotion group over the past number of years, um, kind of starting in the middle of the pandemic. So it's uh, just been a great group of people, and I think we've done a really 